As explorers, these young clusters are important to us. With a lot of stars in one place, it's as if we can take a poll and figure out how common or rare different kinds of stars are in the galaxy. In most clusters, we see quickly that there are a few very big bright stars, maybe a larger number of ordinary stars like our sun, and lots and lots of small dim stars barely visible in the crowd. But how crowded are they really? Stars in clusters are many billions of miles apart. But when we add up their distances in our Starship computer, we find they're much closer together than we're used to at home. The density of stars in the Sun's neighborhood is little more than one star for every 50 cubic light years. In a typical open cluster, there would be 500 stars in the same space. We were once in an open cluster, but we've been around the galaxy so many times now that our sister stars may be all the way on the other side of the Milky Way. What would it have been like for the Sun when it was part of a cluster? To find out, we file a flight plan for a place where stars are forming in a cluster right now. We're headed 1,500 light years from Earth to the Orion Nebula, which looks like a fuzzy star in Orion's sword. Up close, though, it's a spectacular light show. The Orion Nebula is one of the great stellar nurseries that we know of. It's forming stars right now. And if you were to fly through the Orion Nebula, you would see a whole bunch of stars. But near the middle, there are four particularly bright stars. They form a configuration called the trapezium. And if you were to fly past these stars, you would see these four newly formed brilliant stars and a whole bunch of little guys all floating around. It would be a wonderful journey. We head toward the trapezium stars, the four brightest in a cluster that's a hectic laboratory of star formation. Thousands of other stars have formed or are in the process of forming. But as it's happening, Scientists believe the cluster is imposing a kind of birth control on the whole cycle. Only about 10% of the mass of a cloud which will form stars actually becomes stars. So why is it that so little of the matter in a cloud actually turns into stars? What we've come to believe now is that there may be a feedback process. So once you form stars, they feed back on the cloud, acting like a thermostat and actually limiting the amount of star formation that can form. In the trapezium cluster, you've got those four massive stars that are producing enormous amount of ultraviolet radiation, as well as winds that stream into the surrounding area, and they will affect the gas that wants to form stars. So even though you have another thousand stars forming around the trapezium, the star formation rate in that area is being affected by the ultraviolet radiation and the winds from those massive stars. If nebulas are the stellar nurseries of the cosmos, then clusters are their grade schools, where stars stay together until life and the galaxy drives them apart. But it's clear not all clusters are alike. We're due now to encounter clusters that make up some of the most extreme environments in the entire galaxy, where stars are so massive, they are on the verge of blasting themselves into oblivion. When it comes to star clusters, one of the first things most people want to know is, what's the biggest? Which ones really stand out? It's no different than looking at a big city. You want to know about its tallest buildings, its most distinctive landmarks. If there's an Empire State Building of star clusters, we have to travel 10,000 light years to find it. It's called Westerland 1, a supercluster with a total mass 100,000 times our sun. Westerland 1 right now holds the world's record for the biggest known young cluster. It has about 100,000 stars. And what's really odd is for a long time, we didn't even know it was that massive. Astronomers have known about Westerland 1 for a long time, but only about Five years ago, did we first get a glimpse of all the stars in the cluster? 
because that's when we had infrared detectors that could peer through the dust in the galaxy that's situated between the Earth and the cluster. Recent advances in infrared astronomy revealed a space only six light years across, packed with a thick population of stars. The biggest and brightest are galactic freaks, super giant stars in a range of sizes and colors from blue to red and even yellow. The blue supergiant phase and the yellow and red supergiant phase represent phases during the lifetime of a massive star. They start blue, they become red. In some cases, they go back and forth between blue and red as the outer layers are lifted and we see deeper to the hotter material. In between the red and the blue phases, they're yellow, and so we call them yellow supergiants. The sun, which so often is called an ordinary star, is tiny when compared to supergiants of any color. Suppose our sun which is over a hundred times the diameter of the Earth, were scaled down to the size of this little yellow pinhead here, less than an eighth of an inch in diameter. So we're really scaling down the sun a lot. In that case, the largest stars, the red supergiants, would be about the size of this telescope dome behind me. They're huge compared with the sun, and yet the sun itself is already huge compared with the Earth. Supergiant stars, whether blue, yellow, or red, are collectively called evolved massive stars. That means they've burnt out their nuclear hydrogen fuel and are transforming into giants that may eventually explode as supernovas. Supernovas are so bright it's easy to see them from great distances. But David Y. from Wing, Pennsylvania wants to ask the universe if a supernova can cause space and time to warp enough to make us notice a change. David, we sure hope that a supernova will create a big enough disturbance, a warping in space and time to be noticeable. But it won't be easily noticeable. You won't be jostled around. But we hope that the current and future generation of gravitational wave detectors will detect these slight ripples in the fabric of space and time. That's the new unexplored window of astrophysics, gravitational wave astronomy. Our own sun will evolve into a red giant. It will expand enough to engulf Earth's orbit, but it won't reach the size of Jupiter's orbit like supergiants, and it won't explode in a supernova. Having supergiants in a cluster gives us clues to the cluster's age. Now those incredibly massive stars are important because they have very short lives. They only live for maybe five or six million years. So if you see a star, a massive star that's evolved, it's near the end of its life, you know that the cluster can't be more than five or six million years old. Because if it were, that massive star would already have blown up. To date, Astronomers have discovered only a handful of these extremely massive clusters. And like Westerland 1, all of them were virtually unknown until very recently. Just to express how ignorant we are, realize that only 10 years ago, we didn't know about any of these massive clusters. Every young cluster we knew about more than 10 years ago all had less than 10,000 stars. We know of thousands of those kinds of smaller clusters. Right now, we only know of a dozen of the massive clusters. Because our galaxy is so filled with dust, most star clusters discovered so far exist in an area surrounding our particular place in the Milky Way. We can see barely as far as the center of the galaxy. But as technology improves, our view will extend further and further into the more distant spiral arms. Westerland 1 won't be the most massive young cluster known for a long time. We're still discovering these other clusters all the time. A few superclusters are near the galactic core, where the gravitational tides of the Milky Way's giant black hole may rip them apart in just a few million years. For now, though, their massive bright stars are being studied intensely.